Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Lord, thank you for this day and this opportunity to be joined together as one with you and our peers. We gather here to get closer to one another with you and even get closer to ourselves and understand that in this world, we are far from alone. We are worthy, strong, and resilient. Bless us as we become transformed in your name and open our ears and hearts to your word and the experiences of our guests. In this and in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all. Okay. God gives us the understanding of what hardship looks like and what it essentially entails. God shows us that we are created to be resilient. We are created to know what it looks like to undergo hardship and turmoil and how to come back even stronger and better than ever. We are given the tools to be resilient as well through prayer, meditation, attending church services, and simply or simply having a talk with God. Yet sometimes we need more from God. We need to be able to know that our peers are there for us, our mentors. If, if I talk, oh, okay, my bad. All right. That our mentors are available, or we even need to know that our faith keeps us stable as well. Therefore, it deserves to be nurtured continuously. As the word of God explains to us, suffering produces endurance. And as college students, we face struggles every day, which in turn transforms us into durably resilient human beings. Whether that be seen as struggling to get in some more study time before a big exam, struggling to juggle, you know, work with your social life, struggling with personal issues, like things with our family, whatever it may be, we struggle. Yet amidst the struggle, once more, we can be transformed in a multitude of ways, but ultimately for the better. Transformed in order to bounce back from the struggle with confidence and the resilience to continue to succeed. Lastly, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse two says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Once more, seriously, on behalf of Rice, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And uh, now I'm super excited to pass the mic to someone who helped us out a lot in order to make this summit happen. Um, he is a member of Pepperdine's Board of Regents and honestly an overall amazing guy. I had the privilege of uh, meeting him a few months ago uh, while, you know, the RISE members were giving our pitch for the RISE Summit and um, he's amazing. And we are extremely blessed to have his help and to uh, have him here with us today. So um, please put your hands together for Michael Okabayashi. Hello, Pepperdine. It's so good to be with you. Wow. I'm so excited about um, being able to be part of this first Pepperdine Rise Summit. It's, you know, we've come a long way and on behalf of the Board of Regents, your well-being, your developing the skills and resilience is so critical for your success. And you just don't know how, how far ahead we are and, and our superheroes, our superheroes like Connie Horton, 
uh, Shonda Coleman, Stacy Lee, they really are onto something. And I've worked with other universities, but we have something very special here, especially because we're the only university I've had a chance to be involved with that integrates faith. And without faith, there's no hope. So um, what I wanted to sort of uh, share uh, a couple of things. Um, well, one is, um, I already, already mentioned thanks to our superheroes, but um, you know, they have some really superhuman uh, qualities uh, to them. And you don't know what goes behind the scenes, but I, I'm feeling there's some Wonder Woman, some, and for the guys, some Captain America, but then also a little Black Widow there too. So you just, you know, when you're going through some hard times, um, just, just know that they're there for you. Um, and so, so now we're gonna have a chance to uh, hear a little bit about um, some people I'm very excited about. And that's Marv Dumpy and Hung Lee. You know, I've, I've had a chance to get to know them over the years and you're gonna have some special time uh, with them. You might be wondering, you know, earlier today, you know, if anyone's seen me, I'm, I was wearing a suit and tie, but um, I have this enormous t-shirt collection and people in my era, you know, Mail. Sometimes you have one, and you can't get rid of that. Your first 10K shirt, and all these different things. Uh, but I decided that I had to change into this shirt because it's very special um, from Marv Dumphy. And um, before I get to that, I first met Marv because I knew of him as being the Hall of Fame coach, but also being the CEO of the Malibu Roofing Company. And you can Google him on on what that means, the Malibu Roofing Company. And that came about in 1985. But with Marv, um, I had met him, and he, later on that week, I received this package in the mail, and I opened it up, and what did I find in there? And I showed my wife, and it was several sports gear. And I put it on, and my wife said, oh, what are you going to do with those? They're all XL, XXL, and I'm, you know, <laughs> a medium. And so I said, oh, I'm not giving those away, because there could be a time I need it. And so today, I have my gratitude one on. And um, if anyone wants one of these limited editions, you have to you have to get one from Coach Dumphy. But uh, another thing I've um, I've done and I've learned is, um, and I'll, I'll I'll give a little demonstration here. Since this was a little long for me, and I rolled up the sleeves, I said, "What what can this mean from resilience?" All right? And I said, "Oh, it must be the growth mindset." And some of you probably know the growth mindset and cognitive. So that. Well, is one thing. The other thing is when I get stressed and under a lot of tension, I also have my own resiliency. Just because I'm over 50 doesn't mean I don't have to uh, you know, cope or go through these things. So one of the things I do that I learn, and I'm, I've just come up with a name for it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be called the wave. So what I do, it's sort of like what one of your uh, star athletes is, is they, when they go up for a block, they do something like this. Um, and I do it for my stretch. And if you, if you see the guys at the net, they're trying to do the roofing company pose. So I call that the wave. It sort of looks like a wave. Um, so thank you so much. I'm looking forward to you, Marv. And then with respect to Hung Lee, Hung Lee has superpowers too. Um, you might look at him on campus as being like Clark Kent or someone like that, but he sort of like has, has a store power, but it's not in the hammer. He has this glow, magical glow and joy about him. So anytime I'm feeling down and I know that Hung Lee's nearby, I will go to him and, and just, he'll, he'll just give you this joy and love and feeling that exudes from him. So I encourage you to get to know Hung. We'll learn more about him today. So with that, I'm going to, I think our next thing up is we're gonna have a short video. So if you can um, turn your attention to the screen here, um, and we'll continue on. Resilience is about pushing through, through life's hardships, even when you don't want to, or you feel like you can't. It's about getting through whatever obstacles life throws at you with grace and dignity. To me, resiliency is the ability to keep your head up when things aren't looking great. 
and it's knowing that tomorrow is a new day and it's a new opportunity. Having the courage to sit in the uncertainty of life. Having the ability and strength to overcome the trials and tribulations that you um, may, may face. Resilience means the ability to be flexible and adapt. To me, uh, resilience means persevering even through obstacles or difficult times. And it's having the mindset that you can always uh, improve and um, do better. Overcoming life's challenges and coming back from those challenges as a stronger individual. Being resilient means going through a hard time um, and a hard process. And I think it's very important for us to share that with other people. Through storytelling um, and sharing experiences, people can then be built up in that way. So for example, if I hear a story of somebody else being resilient or I could see somebody really exemplifying that, um, if I was to catch myself in a similar situation or helping somebody going through something like that, I have something to draw on. And so just kind of drawing on each other's experiences and building each other up through storytelling is really important. Being able to talk to people, being able to embrace that vulnerability that everybody has is something that is extremely crucial, especially when enduring the hardships that everybody endures in that unique manner as well. Sharing your story can help other people and hearing from others can also teach you new ways to cope with your challenges. When we have authentic conversations about what's going on in our lives, we can help support one another better and build stronger selves and community. Because if we don't talk about it, then we can never bond over things. We can never work through problems. Uh, and it, the problem just gets worse. So a great way to combat that is simply talking about it. We need to talk about it to show people that it's an actual thing that they can manifest in their lives and that they can do it through simple practices that we teach at RISE. I love to do like physical activities. It kind of is like a meditation device for me. I really try to journal every night and then throughout my day, if there's something really weighing on me. Mindfulness is about grounding and recentering yourself and paying attention to the present moment without judgment. If anything, I would say resilience is a mindset that prepares you in the case of a challenge. It's okay to not be okay. And talking with people helps you understand that even though you might not feel great now, that there will be a time where you do and you know things will look much better. Life will never get easier or be easy, but as long as we have the tools that we can get through anything, we can achieve the lives we want to live. Hello, everyone. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ethan Barragan. Uh, this is my second year with RISE, and I have the unique opportunity to be talking to these fine gentlemen. Um, I hope you guys are here to listen to their resilient stories and not just here for bingo night and for the food. Although if you are, then thank you. Um, I'll give you guys the opportunity if you guys want to come closer. I know there's a lot of seats if you guys want to come closer if you'd like. Um, that way you hear them better. That way you're able to potentially be called on um, with just some fun, you know, opportunities to make it engaging. Um, and with that being said, um, now it's my pleasure to invite our first keynote speaker, men's volleyball co head coach, Emeritus, and eight-time Olympic gold medalist, Marv Dumphy. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. And uh, uh, with Ethan, with huh? Ethan's going to be my man here reading all this stuff here in a minute. And uh, uh, so Hung and I go back to the uh, uh, mid '90s. As I'm getting to know him, I said, Hung, let's uh, meet for uh, lunch in the calf. So we go to the calf, and all of a sudden, here's Matt comes up and says, "Hey, I, I need to drop a class. I need to add a class. I need to get a loan. Uh, I need this." And so lunch with Hung ended up being half of Pepperdine. And uh, so then I'm pretty smart, and so I said, Hung. Let's meet off campus. And he knows this is the truth. For years, we went off campus to our secret spots. And Olo, oh, last week, all of a sudden, mid lunch, hung. Thanks for hosting that Bible study, hung. Thanks for the meal that you prepared for us. And it's not only half a Pepperdine, half a Malibu. And uh, he's an all time uh, great wave. And one of the things I like about him is that. Um, there's either a complaint department or a solutions department. And no matter who uh, came up to Hung, he 
he was always in the solutions department and uh, with a great attitude. Um, yeah, I was, I, I like all the definitions of resilience. And uh, so I've been to eight Olympic games and not one, not one has gone according to plan. And uh, I could go story time on each one. In 2008, the day before we play our first match, the head coach's wife and her parents were uh, doing a little tour. His, uh, her mother was uh, stabbed, her father was stabbed, her father died, and we go through the Olympic Games without our head coach until the very end. And even in Tokyo, it was the same thing. We, uh, we ended up winning a gold medal, but we, uh, uh, the first match, and I'm not going to burden you with volleyball, we have this gal that just won the match all by herself. The next match, she sprains her ankle, she goes down. And then the third, uh, third match, our starting setter sprains her ankle and we had to go to plan B. Well, to make the story better, I was gonna go as a spy, serve block defense spy and say, hey, here's how to beat Russia, China, so on and so forth. The uh, government comes to uh, USA Volleyball and says, hey, your assistant coach who works with the setters in the offense on the plane sat behind somebody who tested positive. She's out for 14 days. I'm not a setting coach. Hey, but I, <laughs> I got that job. And uh, uh, anyway, what my takeaway is, uh, you know, adversity is going to happen. We have to embrace it as much, uh, as well as we can. And you have to have plan B, plan C as you go forward. And you can never go wrong with good people. All right, uh, Ethan, you're on here. I'm going to go through this uh, little PowerPoint real quickly. In fact, he's going to read, and then I'll jump in if there's something that I think is worthy. Sounds good. So there's proactive and uh, superior athletes, and there's reactive people, athletes, and inferior. And uh, so the first thing there is two types of people. Obviously, uh, we're not on either end. We're a, a blend of each, and um, you're on. Next slide. Perfect. Two types of people slash athletes proactive slash superior want first want to be accountable ownership Two patterns of success in all aspects of life sorry do this go to uh reactive inferior first yes of course of course go all right reactive slash inferior number one don't want to be accountable for their own results two usually take the path of at, of of least resistance three reactive red flag okay zach you're my man come on up here so I'm a reactive athlete and you're a coach. Uh, let's say you're going to coach uh, this baseball pitcher. So you better teach me how to pitch here. And remember, I'm a reactive athlete. Okay. What? Yeah. Yes. Speak up. I know. I know. I know. I know. Are you going to coach me? You coach everybody else here. You need to teach me how to pitch. Yes. And you said my feet are wrong. But how about my arm? Okay. Yeah, you're good. You're good. All right. So, thanks. Yeah, we could go on and on and I could dehumanize him a little bit more, but, uh, yeah, so the, the reactive types, uh, there's the big red flag even before you get to them. And I guess my method in sharing this little PowerPoint is that uh, for me, it's uh, resilience is toughness and not stupid tough when you see the baseball players take out a Gatorade cooler, or whatever. Uh, when you're tough, you have to overcome things. And uh, anyway, um, reactive types have a red flag stop and they're not very open. The, the proactive, uh, don't take everything that a coach says. Uh, what they do is th they listen and they see what works for them. Keep going, Ethan. Can you hear me? All right, cool. Um, number four, emotion drives logic. Number five, look for soft landing. Okay. Um, what does soft landing mean to you? 
new things or take risks because you're afraid to fail. And so you take the easy route. Yeah. All right, keep going. Ethan. Number six, functional, but you can only stack the deck so far. Yeah, you can make them functional, these types. As a volleyball coach, I can make a react, I can make them functional, but I can't make them champions. Keep going. Number seven, stuck in current reality. And number eight, don't have a sense of urgency. Think they have all the time in the world. Let's go to the proactive superior. All right, proactive slash superior. Number one, want to be accountable ownership. Number two, patterns of success in all aspects of life. Number three, practical people. Number four, not interested in explaining failure. Number five, logic drives emotion. Number six, unique sense of urgency. Ethan, you're doing great. All right. Thank you. So the, uh, the foolish athlete, reactive type people, uh, they think they have all the time in the world to get something fixed in place, uh, project, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, these proactive types have a really neat sense of urgency and that it's not just about today, it's about right now. And uh, I think that's a great quality. Keep going. Number seven, comfortable being uncomfortable. Number eight, vision, current reality. So here's our vision, dreams, goals, vision. Here's our current reality. And if you're always worried about and concerned with your current reality, your vision comes down. Number nine, treat success and failure the same. Learn from both. They learn from both and then they move on. Next slide. Number one, habits. Behavior is learned. Habits are difficult to change. Can I read this next one here? Of course. So uh, in 1968, I was in uh, uh, Vietnam on the perimeter and we had to know how to use the range finder to call in artillery. We had to make sure the Claymore minds were facing the right way and there's an officer of the day that comes by and checks us out and i'd been in country for a while and uh he was asking soldier where'd you get those fatigues they're they're rotting and i said fort lewis washington sir and uh but we he said your weapon's not very clean how do we use this range finder and not only myself but the rest of the crew wasn't that great and he said this and it grabbed me and i use it i don't know every year or so whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, the habits you're developing right now will be with you for the rest of your life. The way you're sitting, you got your hand on your shoe there, so on and so forth. And uh, they're difficult to change. You're my guy. All right, next slide. Number two, respect individual differences. One size does not fit all. Everyone needs a pat on the back. Some just need, some just need it lower than others. All right, I'll jump in here with this uh, resolve conflict. Prior to the London Olympics, uh, Kobe Bryant's gonna talk with our USA team. We had probably 24 athletes. We hadn't cut down to 12. And it was Q&A, wasn't, he wasn't gonna talk, uh, top down lecture. And most of the questions were about pressure. And then we had been in Southeast Asia for 21 straight days and everybody knew everything they wanted to know and didn't wanna know about uh, roommate, teammate, so on and so forth. And the questions were about resolving conflict. And I thought he did a pretty good job. And then he said, hey, here's the example. And I can't use the language that he used, but I think you'll be able to pick it up. They're playing, um, he said, we're playing this uh, San Antonio Spurs. I missed my first 11 shots, TV timeout. My, and he said, my teammate, Steve Blake, sits down next to me and says, you're shooting like, SH, you're playing like SH. And Kobe turns to him and says, You're absolutely right, MF. Now I know what it's like to be you every F and day. And, uh, but yeah, at the end of two, the TV timeout, they hugged it up and they went forward. And, uh, and uh, we weren't supposed to tape them, but we did. And uh, he went into this five minute discussion about. Uh, when you hit a bump, which way do you go? And I'm thinking you go up and uh, or down, I, I thought. And he said, no, you go up. And when you resolve things with a teammate, a roommate, uh, sibling, so on and so forth, yeah, you go up. And uh, you got to do it. Um, 
You got it. Nice. Resolve conflict. No matter what level of play, nor what nor what point is one's career, athletes can never lose the desire to be treated as individuals. Next slide. Number three, how long? Never completely forget about the past, but don't have it, don't, don't have to live in it, good or bad. Keep going. Number four, one of the rarest things people do is do the best they can. Ethan, I'm putting you on the spot here. One yeah. of the rare, this is my little <laughs> saying. One of the rarest things people do yes. is do the best they can. Why do you think I believe that? I just believe that it's difficult for some people to do the thing, the right thing sometimes, or they don't do the right thing because someone's not looking. So. Yeah. And it's difficult. And I'll let you read those. Perfect. The brave don't live forever, but the cautious never live. What is the first thing people think of when they think of you? Don't base self-opinion on how others perceive you. Lastly, don't to become, don't compare. Number five, it's who you are. It's who, it's not where you are. It's who you are. It's not how big you are. It's how good or great you are. So I'll finish with Disneyland. Uh, when I'm looking at people, I want tough, resilient athletes. Uh, they don't have to be King Kong, big and tall, but they, they need to be tough. And it helps if they're a volleyball rat. They're pretty good at the sport. Uh, I tell you the thing that I, I don't, well, I, I look for. I look to see if they're squared away. And then there's some types that need to go to Disneyland to be happy. They're one phone away from being happy. Or my wife is one zip code away from being happy. And you, you want to go with squared away people. Keep going. Perfect. We have five minutes, by the way. Perfect. Number six, toughness versus competitiveness. There's a big difference. Yeah. So we can be competitive at uh, cards, trivia, bingo. All right. But when you're tough, you have to overcome things. And sometimes we qualify for the Olympic Games in a third or fourth world country. And we're going to drink brown water. Or we're going to be sick. We're going to train anyway. We're going to train and we're going to win a gold medal anyway. Uh, and I think, you know, people kind of toughen up when they have to. Um, yeah, keep going. Olympic plans. Toughness is po toughness, a positive response to adversity. Tough times bring out the best in the best of us and the worst in the worst in us. Winston Churchill. Yes, yes, yes. Can I can I count on you? If I'm saying to young Zach here, he's a, vol a potential volleyball type. Zach, if you come here, you're going to play with some really good people. You're going to have a chance to win a, a championship. You're going to uh, earn a good degree, and you're going to have a friend for life. And then I say, I ask him a series of questions. Actually, you can answer these. Are the lights on? Yes. Is that the wall over there? Y yes. Is that hung? Yeah. And then I say, Zach, are you going to be there for me when it gets tough? Yeah. And uh, sometimes I have to say, ask that question uh, a little bit more than two or three times. But, uh, uh, and then I call him on it at some point in time if I need to. Next. Seven, overtime. Just about any individual slash team can jump up and win something one time. The, the truly great champions in any endeavor are great over time. Good things, to take time. good things take time. Success is rarely immediate. Next. Number eight, stress. Comes from uncertainty of the, of the outcome. Let me take, let me take it because we're getting up against the time. Of course. All right. Stress comes from the uncertainty of the outcome. If we knew we were going to win, there wouldn't be much stress. If we knew we were going to lose, wouldn't be too much stress unless our job's on the line. And there's some ways... You can lower that uh, uh, that stress level. One is uh, really good plans, and then when you truly pull for another, uh, that helps also. And uh, I always say this: that selfish people uh, and selfish athletes feel stress, uh, unless they're so whacked out that they're oblivious uh, to the the event. Keep going. Plans and pulling for others. Number nine: champions are problem solvers. They feel there is a solution to every problem. Hung Lee is a problem solver. All right, uh, last slide. I'll, I'll read the last slide. Uh, wait, go back up one. I'm sorry, go to the last one. We're good. Um, I'll just comment on this one thing. There is a tennis coach here. He was the NC2A singles and doubles champ, and he played center court at Wimbledon, big uh, tennis tournament, with a guy named Arthur Ashe. 
he was really tough and probably about this tall. And he's playing, this is back in the day, a guy that was not only uh, beating him, he was controlling him. And I actually was in a class here at Pepperdine and the student said, well, what were you feeling? What was your plan? And he goes, me? He had no chance of winning. And all the sports psych people say this, that hope is not a strategy. They want something, you know, that you can chew on, whatever. And so Alan Fox is playing with somebody that's better. His mindset, which I love, he said, I'm one sprained, I almost thought I was one sprained ankle away from winning that match. In other words, if the guy sprained his ankle, he'd win. And uh, I, I like that thinking. All right, perfect. And one more slide or are we good? I think we're done. We're done. All right, can we give uh, Marv Dunphy a round of applause, please? Now, I'm going to pass it over. Oh, this is the last one, actually. This is the last slide right here. That's a picture of Marv Dunphy right there. For you guys' reference. Anything yeah, to comment? comment on this slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, that quote up there, you do more good than you know. Uh, one of my most favorite human beings in the world uh, is Norval Young. He was the third president of Pepperdine. And he used to say this all the time. And it was such an encouragement. And what a gift it is. And, and Marv says the same thing. And, and what a gift Mar Marv is to this community. So thank you, Marv. Thank you. Now, before Hung Lee shares his story, I just wanted to give a brief introduction, same like I did for Marv. But it's my privilege and my honor to invite our second keynote speaker, uh, Associate Vice President and Registrar, and he founded One Stop, Hung Lee. Thank you, Ethan. I was born in Vietnam. During my years there, I never knew our country without war. One of the things I remember so much is how we would often have bombs that would drop all around us. Safety meant different things there. One of the things I remember so much that touched me and my family so deeply was the joy and the safety we felt with the American soldiers that lived around us. I loved them. They were my heroes. I remember on a daily basis when they would come home from a long day of work, we would know what time they would come home and, and my friends and I, my siblings and I would wait on the road for them. And when we see them coming, we would run towards them. And several of them would take turns picking me up. I would ride on their shoulders. And it was such an incredible gift. They were our heroes. They were there to protect us. They were there to provide for us. They were there to do things that we couldn't do for ourselves. I tell you, these American GIs remain with me to this day. This picture you see in front of me is one of the greatest American heroes there is. His name is Marv Dunphy. He was there when I was a child. And every time I think of those soldiers, I think of Marv. I imagine he, could, he would have been one of those soldiers that picked me up. He was one of the soldiers who cared for me. So what an honor it is for me to stand here with Marv. And so Marv represents all that is good and all that is right. So help me in thanking our American GIs who are represented by Marv Denfi. The stories I tell you tonight are seen through the lens of faith. We have the gift of hindsight. That's a gift that God gives to us. And the gift of faith allows us to see his hand at work. And so tonight, as I share with you the stories, know that these stories are seen through the lens of faith. This is me in 1975. It's the very first picture that I remember being taken of me in this country. It was my first day of school at Olympic View Elementary School in Seattle. See, my clothes there, they're completely oversized. I will grow into them, I remember my, my first foster mom said. 
I love that huge belt buckle. I love this picture because there was so much promise. You see, I, I came over without my family. It was at the end of the war. We didn't know what was going to happen. Actually, we kind of knew. My family knew that with the communist forces coming down south, it was just a matter of days before our country would be taken over. And so my parents sold everything they had to buy my passage to escape Vietnam. So I came out over without them. I grew up with a life goal of becoming a Catholic priest. In fact, just months before that, I had, we had met with, uh, actually a few years before that, we actually met with uh, a, our parish priest to make plans for me to, to join seminary because I was the second oldest son. I didn't have much responsibility. Shortly after we met with the priest, my older brother passed away through a drowning accident. It was devastating. And I remember during the funeral, my mom came to me and said, you do have two younger brothers. You can still be a priest. But then fast forward a few more months, she came to me and she said, honey, I'm so sorry. We need to make some changes and plans. We need you to go to the United States. And your job is to continue the family name. She didn't have to explain much more because I knew a priest could not continue the family name. And so I came to the United States with a, with a very strong purpose, with a very definitive purpose. I came up with my cousin. I lived with him for less than a year. He was very, very abusive. Fortunately, I was rescued by a dear friend who was an American GI, a sergeant in the US Army. His wife was Vietnamese. They rescued me and they, they got me to um, become a, a foster child. And I will always remember the day that I stood before a judge because Uncle Gene took me there to get my name changed back to Hung Lee because I'd come over under a different name. And I remember the judge in his black robe sat behind his desk and he looked at me and he said, today you are a ward of the state of Washington. No one can hurt you. They will have to go through me and more importantly, through that sergeant standing next to you first. What an incredible gift that was. What an incredible safety I felt because of another American GI. During the years, I was, the, the, during the first few years I was in the United States, I lost touch with my family. And after three years, I finally got back in touch. And I found out that my father was arrested and was detained in a re-education re camp. Most people would have been detained for a year or less. But dad was a stubborn man. In order to leave the camp, he had to sign a document joining the Communist Party. And he refused because he knew by joining the party, he would basically have to renounce his Christian faith. And he refused to do that. And so they kept him there. And he was forced in, to, to live like an animal. He suffered for six years. And it was unthinkable, the things that he had to go through. After graduation, I met with a congressman in New York. And I told him my story, and I asked for his help to bring my family over here. I remember Congressman D. Awardy looked at me, and he said, Hung, one of two things need to happen for your family to come over a miracle of God, or an act of Congress. And if I were you, I pray for the miracle. Three months later, a bill went through Congress that allowed the US government to negotiate with the government of Vietnam to allow families of those who have been imprisoned in re-education camp for at least five years to immigrate to America. 
provided that they had a sponsor. God honored my dad's suffering. God honored his resilience. God honored his commitment. His suffering opened the doors for my family to reunite. Indeed, it was an act of Congress and a miracle of God all rolled into one. And so in July of 1991, after 16 years, I got to hear my mother's voice call my name at Los Angeles International Airport. My knees buckled. I couldn't move. It was one of the greatest gifts. All the abuse, all the suffering, all the pain of separation, the death of my sister, the suffering of my father, all melted in that moment as we fell into each other's arms and gave God praise for the gift of reunion. This is one of my most favorite pictures. When they came over, our, the Pepperdine community surrounded us. As they surrounded us from the first day I came to Pepperdine in 1983. They provided for my family. And in this picture, we're opening presents that our friends and our families from Pepperdine and our friends from the, the, uh, my years here as a student I sent. And you see the joy in our faces, my dad raising his hands in victory. It was a proclamation that indeed, God overcomes, faith overcomes, hope lives, and resilience kept us going. One of the greatest gifts in my life is a gift to my family. I came to Pepperdine looking for a, a great school. I needed a good education that will allow me to get a really good job, make a lot of money so I can bring my family over here. God looked at me and said, I have something greater for you. Indeed, he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I never imagined that we'll find this incredible family here, this community that continues to surround us, to assure us of the goodness of God that strengthens us so we can go on another day. We're so grateful for this gift. And to get to be here with all of you and to be here with one of my heroes, what an incredible blessing it is. Thank you. Thank you for, for listening to the stories. Can we give uh, both Marv Dunphy and Hung Lee another round of applause for their stories? All right, perfect. Um, for those of you who just joined us, um, you guys came just in time for the Q&A and for the conversation. I'm going to be helping to facilitate if you guys want to grab a seat, um, and then we're almost, almost done here. So I have the unique opportunity to have a conversation with these fine gentlemen after sharing their unique, resilient story. And I prepared some questions. The RISE team prepared some questions, as well as many of you in the audience who registered for this event had the opportunity to write in some questions. And so I, yes. I, I'd just like to add this. I, I talked about uh, uh, time with Hung in the cafeteria, and I, I made light of people wanting, you know, a better grade, you know, drop a class, add a class. But, you know, uh, why did they go see Hung? People know where love is, and uh, people are attracted to love, and uh, uh, that's contagious, and that's the kind of person he is. Yes, and yeah, as you mentioned, you could definitely find Hung Lee on campus. I'm sure maybe, maybe don't bother him during lunch. However, he's definitely a familiar face on campus. Same with Marv as well at the, at the volleyball games. I hope to see many of you guys there as we end our, end our season. And so kind of hopping on to the first question, you know, how have your personal experiences shaped your view on resilience? And how has your relationship with one another had an impact? I'd say this, uh, uh, coaching and teaching is a, is a two-way street. I'm really big on mutual expert exploration. And uh, mm -hmm. for me, it's, uh, it's learning from and knowing that uh, the athletes, I care about them and they care uh, about me. And uh, I'm ready to take on the world with the, the people that we've, I've been around. Yes, I mentioned earlier, uh, the gift of hindsight is a powerful gift. It allows us to see 
how God has carried us through. During, you know, when, when we're in the midst of pain, we're in the midst of loss, midst of disappointments, it's really hard to see that. But when we're able to step back and see how God has guided us through this, it allows us to just take another step. And um, I, I'm going to steal something that, that Marv said during one of our meetings. Okay. Um, you know, Ethan asked, uh, asked Marv, so, because, you know, Marv's an incredible coach, but you know, we're award-winning Olympian athlete, all that. And so surely there's a mamba that he puts his um, athletes through. And so Ethan wanted Marv to talk about the mamba. And so I'm sitting up in my seat, listening to what this mamba is all about. And Marv, in his incredible wisdom, said, you know, it's not that. I used to tell our guys to keep battling. You guys, that is golden. That is what resilience is all about. Stay engaged. Keep battling. And that is one of the greatest gifts that Marv has given to me. I think, uh, Ethan, I think you were asking for the magic, right? Yes, and I, I, yes. If there's any magic, I would probably hold on to it and then sell it for lots of money, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you're right. I, I, when I first started uh, coaching, I, I think at some point in time when I was an athlete, I got in a groove or the flow or whatever. And I kept thinking, yeah, how do we do this? And, uh, you know, to visualize or to this and that. And early on, I realized that that might happen one, two, three, four, five percent of the time. The rest of the time, you're just trying to be as good as you can when the situation is what it is. And uh, uh, yeah, it's just being as good as you can. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask the second question. Many of you in the audience asked this question. I'm sure this is a question burning on all our minds. But how did you two meet? And how long have you guys been friends? And how have your paths, how have your paths kind of crossed in recent years? Okay, when so. I was a student, Marv Dunphy, like he is now, was an iconic figure. I, I got to see Marv <laughs> from afar. And I just dreamed of the day to get to talk to Marv. And so when I came back to work, I remember one of the, the first or second year, we were in a meeting. I, was, I used to plan NSO. So... Um, we had one of those meetings and Marv came to it. And I was giddy. I, I couldn't even speak. And um, it was amazing how, how wonderful it was to, to be able to talk with Marv. And our friendship continued to grow. And now it, it's incredible. When, you know, I'll, I'll get a phone call from Marv and he'll ask, you know, are you free for lunch? I always say yes, even if I, I'm not. I, I, I say yes, and then I call up the other person and say, can we reschedule? Um, because I never want to give up an opportunity to sit in front of Marv and to learn from him. And even to this day, I, I just have to pinch myself that I get to, to be with Marv. Keep going. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, the neat thing about our, our friendship is that uh, it's, I think there's mutual respect, and we don't have to... Uh, talk every day call every day or every week and and we just know that it's there and uh you know i know that uh, that he cares and he knows that i care and it's uh yeah, it's a nice relationship thank you thanks thanks i really appreciate that this is a modern day bromance that i wish i could have with many of my friends here today so thank you um kind of going back into that subject you know what inspires you about each other what is something that you guys kind of take away from each other? Yeah, so I, I already mentioned it. You know, the uh, uh, I like people that, uh, regardless of the situation, you know, you, you enter into it like a match, and either you're good enough or you're not. You learn from it, and you, you move on. It's kind of like that how long thing. And, uh, um, yeah, I, I just marvel at the, the, no matter how tough the issue that we would discuss, the issues, he was always in the solutions department, and I love people like that. You know, I get to meet with many of our uh, recruits and to tell them about Pepperdine. And the thing I always tell them is that, you know, Marv values integrity. 
He's a man of character and he expects it and he develops that in his players. And through that, they bring us much honor. And so, so Marv, he's a very skillful athlete. He's an incredible coach. And on top of that, uh, un un undergirding that, is a strong foundation of character and integrity. Yeah, I'll just add this. Uh, so we uh, take recruits by, you know, uh, there's some people here that have visited with re recruits and hung. And then afterwards, I say, what do you think? And Lee Katz is here. And Lee grew up on the farm. And, and Lee said, this guy wouldn't make it on the farm. And uh, <laughs> then I value Hung's every word. And it's uh, he's right on. So Hung, don't mess it up. We need good players, good people. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, kind of individual questions to both of you guys, just because we're you know strapped on time. But Marv, what do you think? What do you think Hung Lee means to Pepperdine? And then Hung, what does Marv mean to Pepperdine? So Hung is an all-time great wave. And uh, other than George Pepperdine, I think he has done more for Pepperdine than anybody I'm aware of. And I've, I've been here uh, since 72, and Hung has touched the lives of uh, uh, just about everybody that I know. Marv exemplifies goodness. He is purpose, service, leadership, all rolled into one. He shows us what it is to be a good human being, one who cares for others, and one who lives with purpose. And so he, he means everything to Pepperdine. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that they erect two statues of you guys. Um, I hope to take a picture with those before I graduate or even to come back and take a picture of those. Me and George have a, have a few photo shoots together. So um, moving on, you know, how, you know, do you have any tips to share about, you know, building a lifelong and meaningful relationship? Obviously, you two gentlemen have a really solid relationship. And what are some advice or some tips you'd give people in the audience and myself um, on how to build those, you know, lifelong, meaningful relationships? It going to be pretty short, uh, especially if you're married. Being right is overrated. Just keep that in mind. Amen. Amen. The, the <laughs> other is to be liberal in your expression of gratitude. I think it's really important for us to, to truly feel it. And to say it to one another, um, we need to more of that among all of us. What has been the most difficult adversity you have personally faced and how were you able to overcome it, if so? I, I, I think uh, for me, it's uh, end, of, end of life scenarios, whether it's uh, when I was younger, it was uh, our dog, you know, a pet, and then siblings, parents, a uh, fellow soldier. and. Uh, and, and pretty much, I, I, you know, with the stuff that I shared at the beginning, I, I like to front load everything uh, with an athlete. Hey, tomorrow, here's what we want to get in place and, uh, and let them know what's coming up front. So, and, and part of that is, uh, along with that is, um, yeah, I can't tell the story. <laughs> yeah, keep going. you're good. Would you like to answer that question? Well, I have one more picture to show you. Um, this is my sister. Um, I would have to say that losing her um, was one of the, probably the darkest period of my life. She's, she's one of the boat people. She escaped Vietnam to come to take care of me. I went to a really dark place. I was angry with her for dying. I was angry with my parents for um, letting her go. I was angry with the communist government for being so oppressive that she had to leave. I was angry with myself, but most of all, I was angry with God. And I remember declaring that God is dead because there's no way that God could be alive and my sister still be there. It took an atheist, my best friend, who came to me and said to me, Hung, if you believe in God, which I believe you still do, despite what you try to do, you must believe that he works on his timeline and not on yours. That shook my world. That changed my view of God. That changed my relationship with him. It was no longer transactional between him and me. It became more relational. I became more honest with him. I was able to be angry with him 
and still be okay. And so it was a growth experience through pain. Thank you for your honesty. And I really appreciate you sharing both of your personal stories. Um, last question in the interest of time, a question that was highly asked in the form that many of you guys filled out. But what is your main driving force day in and day out when your motivation may, see, which may seem to wane on some days? What is your motto? <laughs> yeah, it, I'm probably not too sophisticated with that. But uh, uh, I think when the sun goes down, if I'm outside and I try to be outside, I ask myself, did I give and did I get my money's worth? And uh, uh, and my advice is to young people is it goes pretty fast and, and don't waste your days. And uh... for me, it's an, uh, a matter of purpose. Um, you know, Jesus said, I have come that my, they might have life and have it abundantly. And so as someone who, who claimed Jesus as my savior, I want to live out his mission. And so as difficult as it, is, as it is in certain days, I, I try to see what it is that I can do using what the, the gifts I have in the community God has placed me and say, what can I do to make life more abundant for others? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you guys to walk away with that motto that they share, both their models that they shared. And now I'd like to I'd like to wrap up the Q and A session with a round of applause. If we could give them one more round of applause, and then and then I'd like to pass the mic to Lashonda Coleman for some closing remarks. So thank you guys all for listening. Thank you, Ethan. Let's give it up for Ethan, the moderator here. Awesome job. Um, this is a dream realized and you are a part of it. Uh, we don't take for granted your presence. We're so grateful that you said yes to the invitation to be a part of the inaugural Rise Summit. Uh, this will not be the last. Um, this is an amazing start hearing the stories, the wisdom of both Marv and Hung. Thank you so much for your generosity and spirit in life and all that you are and all that you give. Uh, we don't take your story lightly or for granted. It is a privilege to witness you. It is a privilege to do life alongside you. So thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I want to uh, present you with a, a token of our gratitude. It doesn't hold all the gratitude that we have for you, but our hope is that it will remind you that your presence here today and every day matters. Um, that the stories, the, the, the nuggets of truth and wisdom that you uh, given so generously here. Every time you look upon this gift that we have for you, we hope that you're reminded that, that it landed well with us. Um, so I want to present to you, Marv, as one of our first keynote uh, speaker for the RISE Summit 2022 here at Pepperdine University. Uh, we thank you for your service, and we pray that you continue to inspire others to rise. Thank you so much. God bless you. Mr. Hung Lee, <laughs> I feel like we're commencement. <laughs> Hung, you are a pillar in this community and we see you. We are so grateful for you. And um, similarly, thank you for being one of our inaugural keynote speakers for our RISE Summit 2020, uh, 2022 here at Pepperdine University. Thank you, there's your plaque. And I'm going to invite Stacy. you're way back there, but I need you to come down here with me, please. Um, if y'all can give it up for Stacy Lee Gobier, who is our assistant director for RISE. I wanna say a few things before we present this pack. Uh, Stacy and her team, for all of our student leaders and RISE staff, if you can please stand up uh, where you are. Yes. We could not do this without you. Um, we recognize you and Stacy. we recognize, thank you, you can be seated. We recognize your leadership, Stacy. You are amazing in every way and Stacy is smiling underneath this mask. 
Um, sometimes folks lead from up front and you see all the wonderful things they do and there's a place for that and that's amazing. But sometimes folks are also working diligently in the background and sometimes they're never seen, but you feel all of the impact of their work. And Stacy is both, she stands out front, but she also encourages others to stand out front and she's working always uh, in the background to encourage our students to lead, um, especially Ethan. And so Stacy, I wanna hand this over to you to present to Ethan um, as you have inspired him to lead. Ethan, we're so grateful for your leadership. Thank you for being our facilitator of our first inaugural keynote. Um, the keynote of our first inaugural RISE Summit. We're so grateful for you. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, LaShonda. Thank you. Madeline, please, I'd like to invite Madeline up here. Please give a round of applause for Madeline. She'll be providing all the information you need to know for the rest of the evening. And I wish I could make eye contact with every single one of you, but thank you from the bottom of our hearts and from RISE for being here tonight and holding these amazing stories. So thank you. Thank you, Stacy, and to Lashonda, and again to all of our speakers. Um, now we will be transitioning to the dinner portion of our summit. Um, so a couple of reminders before you all go out the doors in the back. Um, first, make sure you have your red tickets out and ready because we'll be handing those in in order to get your food. Um, and second, if you are a part of the first 150 students to sign up for the event, you will get a sweatshirt. So um, if you um, go back to the check-in table after this, you can go pick up your sweatshirts. And then lastly, um, bingo will start in about an hour. Um, so now I invite you all to go and eat some tacos. 